Yeah, that's sciency. That and having and have uh, doctors doing advertisements for for cigarettes too. That was a very common one. Ah, oh, the good old days. We go out to eat, and everybody in the restaurant smoking, and the dash race full butts on every table. I'm glad it's not like that anymore, even though I think you guys are going to stop with it. You're too cocky. Oh, yeah, they're not going to keep people from smoking there. They're gambling. Oh, yeah. They're going through packs of cigarettes and rolls of quarters, silver dollars, or whatever it might be. All right, so let's go ahead then. And first thing is first, it's going to take out your notes and finish at the end of the period. I'll give you the last 10 minutes to do the DBQ. I think it's an interesting place. I have never been there. It doesn't interest me. I'd say go just to see it. That's yeah. what Mr. Chauncey was telling about. That. Yeah. Yeah. We were comparing our spring break. Even if you don't like it, just come see it for once. Like, 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 <laughs> you, you know what would crack me up? Is even when there's a bunch of traffic coming, if one person across the street, the whole horde, <laughs> just, even if the cars had to like break two feet in front of them, everybody would cross. That's pretty funny. They're just like, oh, that one guy went, we should all go. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Chauncey never talked about spring break. He went to Vegas. He was like, saying, "Oh, Vegas is horrible, but the people watching is great." Oh, yeah, so that's what. Yeah. You know. Okay, so we got a few things covered. Then we're gonna draw, uh, watch the ball. Where did we finish it here? Night fire. Do we mention kamikaze? Yeah. Mention subs. Yeah. All right. Good. And the subs with the uh, sub what? Did you say wolfers? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> she wants to hit you, Dale, but I won't let her. All right, so. So we have subs. We have, and do we mention anything about the fire bomb or he just literally began? Okay, so firebombing the commander, did we say him? Perfect. Curtis bombs away LeMay, was the man put in charge of. Curtis bombs away LeMay, and he would become one of the most important. <laughs> what? The bomb calls, his name was Curtis. Oh, I didn't even think about that. The May is going to be really important. It'll be the genius staff of the Air Force. If the May would have had its way in 1962, you guys would not have had to worry about the AP exam. Next. Yes, because he would have blown the he would have to blow the world up. Oh, oh. that's nice. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not kidding. Go to Cuba Missile. But LeMay changed the tactics to fireball. And in some ways he was also a very good, very great general. He was a jerk, but I'm not gonna hang out with him, so I don't care. But LeMay changed it. And that is when they resorted from high level to low level bomb. And did we say the first city they bombed? Tokyo. March 1945, Tokyo. And instead of going at 30,000 feet, did we mention the jet stream? Yes. And the balloons? Okay. So they went about 11 to 12,000 feet, filled them to the brim with incendiary bombs, fire bombs, white phosphorus, but the big one was the new uh, fire bomb created by the DuPont Corporation called Napalm. You probably heard of napalm, jelly gasoline. And now they'll fly low. They're not going to try to hit specific industrial targets or transportation or oil. 
these people, just kill people. And it was a thousand plane wreck. Basically bombed for olives. And Tokyo has, it's warm there, very moderate climate, and a significant number of buildings, especially private residences at this time, might have a wood frame and a very heavy roof, but the walls are actually wax paper. Kind of oil, you just keep the rain out because it's warm there. Can you imagine what that's going to do with the fire? And that's what happened. They bombed the night of the 3rd and the 4th of May of 1945. These planes laid down a carpet of firebombs in residential areas. They, they did avoid the Emperor's Palace. And it created a firestorm. Now, the first man made firestorm actually happened in. In Hamburg in 1943, when the British firebombed it, because the Americans and the British did it in Berlin and in Dresden. But a firestorm is where the fire gets so intense, so hot, and so big that it basically almost becomes a weather pattern on its own. It starts sucking in oxygen from everywhere. And the winds sucked into the fire can be as high as 150 miles an hour. And that just superheats the fire up to a thousand degrees and it'll kind of lift up and explode out of itself consuming more until eventually runs out of fuel. And so you have this super hot fire that's super destructive, obviously. But people went into their shelters. They're underground. And they might have survived the explosions and the fire, but because of the firestorm, it sucked the air off. And thousands would be found in their shelters asphyxiated. The next day, between 35 and 40 percent of Tokyo was gone. We're talking of the city of the size of New York City, <clears throat> actually a little bit bigger, gone, flat, and 150,000 civilians dead. And they got a promotion. And they began to firebomb every Japanese city. The only reason they didn't firebomb more is because they would literally run out of bombs. And so they were in their bases here in the Marianas, and every shipment of firebombs, they bombed more cities until they'd run out. Tokyo, over half of it, would be flattened by the end of the war. You understand, you know, this is a massive city, but every city, any, with any kind of industrial base, especially would be attacked, except for one. One city was left alone, but every place was bombed. Some would be a relatively minor 300 plane raid. A city called Toyama, which is about 150,000 people, was completely flattened. Nothing left. Gone. But even Kobe and Kyushu, the size of Chicago and Los Angeles, between 40 and 60 percent gone, just flattening everything. And this went on from March until August. In fact, the last firebombing raid was on its way to attack Japan. In fact, in sight, they could see Mount Fuji on Japan when they announced that the Japanese did formally surrender. So they firebombed this whole time. We don't know exactly how many civilians were killed. They did evacuate a lot of the city, but we're talking hundreds of thousands. Estimates as high as over a million. With the war and the disaster afterwards, really hard to tell exactly how many. But this went on the whole time. So we have subs. We have the Japanese military basically gone. Their fleet is basically gone. They get no supplies. And they're now being firebombed. Now, we can look at it a couple different ways. You can look at it one way is, and they still won't quit. Or you can look at it another way as, they can't fight any longer. They are completely and totally defeated. Militarily, by the summer of 1945, Japan was completely defeated. They were completely done. Now it's an argument of how they'll surrender. <clears throat> so when they talk about the atomic bombs, don't forget one thing, and I'll mention it again because it's a really important point that people forget all the time, and it's easy to do because of how dramatic an atomic bomb is. Yes, two atomic bombs were dropped. Yes, it did destroy Three or two thirds of Hiroshima and about forty percent of Nagasaki gone. That was happening all the time. It already happened. It's not like that was new. It's like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden two thirds of the city's gone. No, every place that was happening too. You can use your imagination. The topic bombs are a lot more scary, but just think about it logically that way. And so, while this is going on. Japan is near it. What were the two islands I told you about, though? That was so bloody and so horrible. Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima. Those are really good examples. Let's say if you're doing something crazy like a DBQ talking about the atomic bomb. That's been it. 
and talk about how hard the Japanese fought, that kamikazes, that kind of thing. And don't forget how they treated their POWs. And they started it. All these things matter. But in July of 1945, Potsdam, another big three. But unlike Yalta, which we talked about yesterday, everything is different. Germany has surrendered. Japan is about done. At Yalta, Roosevelt was desperate to get Russia into the war. Now, in July, Truman's trying to figure out a way to keep Russia from getting into the war. Potsdam. We rewrite it. Potsdam is a little city outside of Berlin, and it's the capital of the old Prussian Empire. They get a chance to go there. Have, uh, the old the, uh, Frederick the Great's castle is really cool. And they have all these gates. Big bloody city. And if you like sausage, they're Germans. All right, so they met there. The big three is a lot different now. You have Stalin as the conquering hero. And boy, did he ever come in with this nice, bright white uniform. He was the warlord. He was the victor. But then things are a lot different. Here's Truman. And here's Clement Attlee. Churchill went to Potsdam for the first day. Then they had an election in Britain for the first time since the war began. Remember, there are parliaments, so they don't have, they don't have terms. Churchill went back. His party lost. The Labor Party won. And the head of the Labor Party, Clement Attlee, came back. Now, Attlee was in Churchill's wartime cabinet. So unlike Truman, Attlee knew exactly what was going on. He was in the loop when Truman wasn't. But still, they got Stalin, though. Yes. You can imagine how we looked at these two. He outmaneuvered giants, FDR, Churchill. Who's Truman? Has anyone heard of that? If that's John Clement, who actually was a very able prime minister, he'd be a prime minister a couple times. Churchill would be prime minister a couple more times, too. You know, Britain's a lot different. They, they recycle these guys. But, and when Truman got there, he knew Stalin thought he was coming. He knew it. Truman was desperate to show he was tough. Remember, I told you yesterday, right before this happened, when James Burns, soon to be uh, Truman's Secretary of State, Burns was there. And Burns said, Got to make him play ball. You got to get tough on him. Because he, Stalin promised free elections where? Eastern Europe, but the big one was Poland, because that's where the war started. And they're worried, maybe we'll have to deal with this in Europe, or I'm sorry, in Asia. So, a couple things came out of this. But in reality, you could argue, the Cold War is already kind of beginning. There'll be one event that we say, you know, that's the beginning of the Cold War. But they're already um, basically maneuvering for position. And Truman is desperate to look tough. And at it, Stalin just simply informed the other two guys, you know that whole thing about elections? You know that? <laughs> no. Not going to do it. No elections. He applied down the road, but he just made it very, very clear. And there wasn't anything the U.S. and Britain could do. There's no way they're going to go to war with the Red Army. So they're kind of stuck. Next. At Yalta, it was promised that there'd be some kind of reparations from Germany. Germany would have to give something back to, to the Soviet Union. And here, Truman and Attlee informed Stalin, no, no reparations. That was such a disaster after the Treaty of Versailles, we won't do it. But that infuriated the Stalin, infuriated the Stalin. The Stalin. They promised to continue to lend lease aid long after the war ended. Russia's going to be really resentful of this. All this area of Russia here was just destroyed. It was a wasteland. And they lost over 25 million people. The United States never realized how much suffering the Soviets had, how much destruction that they had to rebuild from. And that would be important in the Cold War because the Soviets just assumed the United States must know what's going on here. And the U.S. looked at it 
totally different way. Ignorance leads so much of these kind of conflicts. Three. Stalin did not technically do this, but they would issue the Potsdam Declaration, telling Japan to surrender or else. But for the first time, the Potsdam Declaration implied there might be negotiation. Implied it. And the idea was, can we get Japan to surrender now? Just get them to quit. Japan actually looked at this as, if we hold up a little bit longer, we can get what we want. We can get what we want. And last, the bomb. The bomb. While Potsdam was going on, Trinity was exploded. And so a code got to uh, Truman. Just a little piece of paper, and it said, the baby is born. Trinity worked. He had three bombs. Trinity worked, and he had two more. And how did Truman feel when he heard? How do you think he felt? Hmm? Say it again. Three. Yeah, elated, overjoyed. And he told Churchill, because Churchill actually, Britain kind of lent some scientists to help build up the idea they'd come back to Britain and help Britain build their bomb. But then, Truman could not wait to tell Stalin. He could not wait. And he went to Stalin just overjoyed. He's like, I got you. I got you now. And it was, he said, we have a bomb that can destroy a city. One bomb, one city. And he expected Truman, or he expected Stalin to be scared. <sighs> you know, in, in awe. And all Stalin did is he just popped on his pipe and said, Good. I hope he is. Truman's like, damn, I wanted you to be scared. You're supposed to quake. You're supposed to be shivering in fear. Why was Stalin so nonplussed by this? Why was he out? Did know it That's actually a very good guess, but no. He wasn't sure about that. Huh? They, they were starting, yeah, but they weren't, that, they weren't far at all. You're, you're close. He already knew about the bomb. They had spies at Los Alamos. The plans for the Fat Boy bomb were already on the way to the Soviet Union. When they would build their first bomb in 1949, it was an exact duplicate of that bomb. So they weren't thinking about building it, but now they have. In fact, you know the other funny thing? The B-29 bomber that the Americans used, a bunch of them landed in the Soviet Union during the war to when they were damaged. And they took that bomber and reverse engineered it and started making those planes to, to use them to the 1970s. And so the Soviets, you already know. He went to his head of the secret police, a, a horrible man by the name of Bavaria, and said, I don't care who you have to kill, I want a bomb. Yeah. He didn't care. So that's what happened there in Potsdam. And so when Truman went back, he was actually, um, you know, going back over joy. He thought he stood up to Stalin. He uh, really thought things were going well. Now, did we mention anything here about the Japanese peace terms? While this is going on, before and after, Japan was actually originally through Switzerland, but then through the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviets were neutral in the Pacific War up until August. Japan was sending out peace builders. Japan was talking about peace negotiations. Actually, I guess the word I'm looking for, terms. They had a term. And they narrowed it down, and they thought the Potsdam Declaration hinted at it, even though that was never the intent. The term, and it's only one. The belief was, if we can keep our emperor, that will satisfy enough of the officers who are rabid about Bushido. Maybe they'll accept that if we can keep our emperor. And so they went to Switzerland, and that went nowhere, but then it went to the Soviet Union. And the, the Soviets just kind of, yeah, we'll think about it. They're coming. And they want as much land as they can get. Truman did find out about this and totally ignored it. Nope, can't do it. And there's lots of reasons why, but the reason he said and wrote in his diary 
plus what? Hmm? Well, partial unconditional surrender. Good guess. That's actually a very good answer, but no. It wasn't even thinking about Japan coming back. You think Russia would respect that? You think Stalin would respect that? If we negotiate for peace after we say we're not going to? How are we ever going to be able to stand up the Soviet Union if we won't stand up for what we believe in? It's the Soviet Union. Here they are setting up dictatorships, and who knows what's going to happen to Germany, and here they come in the West. The Soviets are coming. And one more thing I have to add. Truman never made an order to drop the atomic bomb. Never. Right after it was dropped, and until Truman died, he claimed he made the order. He said, I made the order, and I thought about it, and I weighed the different options. No. All he did, in essence, was check off that they could use it whenever the Army Air Force decided it was necessary. He never made an order. Never. I guess you could argue he could have said, no, maybe we shouldn't drop it. But no, it was not like, hmm, let's think about all the implications. It's going to be a myth. And Truman will present this because he wanted to make it appear like he was making the decisions. He's the president. His favorite saying was, the box stops here. I make the decisions. He actually was like, use it whenever. And there's an image of Truman that was popularized by a really well-known biography called Truman. They made a movie about it that was pretty popular, a mini series about 20 years ago. This idea of Truman, he was like walking around the, the yards of the yards, the yard of the White House, pondering what a terrible decision this was. Didn't happen. I think after the war he realized how scary this is. The idea that it was really very casual decision to use the atomic bomb. Oh, did we talk about why they didn't do a test? Some of the scientists, especially when they started realizing what this bomb could actually do and how many people it could kill, they didn't understand the firebombing that they're already killing so many. They said, why don't we do a test? Let's just fly over an island and tell Japan we're going to drop this bomb and this is what's going to happen to Tokyo unless you agree. But that was universally thrown out. Two reasons. Well, one, I guess, I'm sorry, three reasons. One, partially, you know, Japan might think we really not the guts to use a bomb, but then again, that's probably not a good reason. But the other two are legitimate. One is very simple. Let's say we make a big deal about it. We're going to blow up this island with an atomic bomb. <coughs> the plane flies over, the bomb drops, and it just goes, the six in the mud and does nothing. We look like idiots. We better not warn them. Secondly, we look soft, weak, they thought, compared to whom? Look how many Soviets died in World War I and they kept fighting. And we don't have the guts to use a weapon of war against our enemy that attacked us first. How would they ever respect what we want in Europe? Everything is about Europe. So, we, I stopped it at Trinity, if I remember right. Did we watch the Trinity explosion? We did. That's Edward Teller. Yeah, we didn't get very far at all. Oh, so we didn't get the actual bombs? No. no we're not. Oh, we said like two minutes in. Two minutes. Quit whining, you people. Okay, that is the little boy bomb. And that is the bomb they were pretty sure would work. The uranium gun weapon, or little boy bomb, was a simple design. And scientists were confident it would work without testing. Literally, they shot a piece of uranium with a or an explosion bomb, bomb was a more efficient design using plutonium instead of uranium. That's the design that was on its way to Boston. Inside the very center of the bomb was an initiator plutonium. surrounded by a sphere of plutonium. This sphere was encased within a set of symmetrically located high explosive lenses, creating an implosion which forced the plutonium into itself. 
attaining critical mass. So they weren't sure, let alone they weren't sure if it would cause a chain reaction in the atmosphere and blow the world up. The scientists were watching this and taking bets on whether or not it would blow the world up. And the army guards there were unabused by the bets inside. A blast instantly raised temperatures to 10 million degrees, releasing a force of a million pounds of pressure, vaporizing the tower and all desert life within a half a mile. The intensity of light was sufficient to cause temporary blindness to an observer 10 miles away. 21,000 tons. Now look at this shot. Remember this is the 100 ton With a year, blast. 200 tons. See that? That black spot there is a crater for 100 tons. That's a huge explosion is greater than the 100 ton the test. The fireball created a crater nearly one half mile across and fused the desert sand into a green glass still containing traces of radioactivity 50 years later. So what initiated this was the astronaut. And they were actually pretty sure about end of 43, Germany wasn't making a bomb. They didn't have a resource. Now, this is a one of the propaganda films from some of Pearl Harbor plunged the United States into war. For three years, gathering momentum with each small victory, our forces had conducted an offensive against the war floated empire of the rising sun. Slowly, island by island, mile by mile, and then with every quick thing sweep, the combined land, sea, and air forces of the Allies drove against the borders of that empire, forcing it back until late in 1945, only the bastions of the Japanese home islands remained to be stormed. Right there are the big B-29 bombers. And the Japanese bombers were actually the ones that Ahead lay the greatest campaign of all, invasion of the Japanese homeland and close-in desperate fighting. The fanatical true. enemy would not quit until her last fighting man had been driven That's from his cave and killed, had been established time and again by bitter experience. That's a dead so this is the Mariana, it's a little island next to The father and night squad was specially trained he brought this bomb. They didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, they had this application with this crater who was still bomb we carry. That's a little boy bomb. It came out right. You know, Paul Tibbetts, the commander of the squadron, a very accomplished pilot, he flew it. He gave it out to this bomb with a plane. And they came out with this. That's what it was. There we go.
August 9th, Nagasaki. August 15th, Japan surrender. Ready to go to the bottom? Yeah. That's your achievement. You see how flat it is so the explosion just spread. This was the city they never fired on. The uranium gun so weapon, or little boy bomb, was detonated over Hiroshima at an altitude of 1,800 feet, the height to achieve maximum blast effect. Three days later, a fat man implosion bomb was detonated over Nagasaki. In Hiroshima, 70,000 people were killed or listed as missing. Of its 90,000 buildings, over 60,000 were demolished. The implosion bomb dropped on Nagasaki took the lives of 42,000 people and injured 40,000 more. It destroyed 39% of all the buildings in the city. With a yield of 20 kilotons, similar to that of Trinity, this weapon would be considered a nominal atomic bomb and provide a blueprint for all future nuclear weapons. The explosion was big, but the biggest killer is fire. It's the fire that killed. What is this? People are weird. Okay. Me included. Ah! Bad news. <laughs> I hate curriculum meetings. Okay. So, with that, those two bombs, in between, another big event happened. So on August 6th, that is the little boy bomb on Hiroshima. August 6th, the Enola Gay. And the Japanese government knew it happened. They had hardly time even to access the damage when on August 9th, the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. The plane that dropped that, a little bit of trivia for you, was box car. What was Ox science, that is the plutonium bomb or Fat Man. Fat Man. This is the far too round version of Fat Man. And yeah, and yeah they did they put things on like you know um, uh, Merry Christmas Hero Vito and stuff like that. They wrote on this so that's the stuff they used to do. Still do. But was this the box car was the plane that dropped up in Nagasaki. Okay. And the thing is about this, when they did realize both of what happened, yeah, it was shocking. They knew it was a, a one bomb. So they knew it wasn't a significant number of fire bombs. It's a different type of raid. But in reality, as bad as it was, it wasn't that big of a deal for the Japanese war cabinet because their cities were already being destroyed. There was no big difference. And they weren't thinking long term, which my guess is all of you should be thinking. You know, it's scary. One plane, one bomb. How many planes dropped the bomb on Tokyo that first How many? A thousand. thousand. So think about one plane, one bomb to destroy a city. Now think of all thousands of those, all thousand B 29 bombers, each with an atomic bomb. That's when atomic war first starts getting scary, because that's the end of the and so that was something, but to the Japanese in August 8th, whatever. We got our own, we got the war issues right now. But then on August 8th, 1945, the Red Army attacks Manchuria. And it's one of the most amazing military operations that everybody forgets about, especially the United States, because we care about what we're doing in World War II. The Russians did the fastest military operation in history. An awesome attack. Over a million men, thousands of tanks swept across Manchuria. In fact, they kept going even after the Japanese surrender. They took as much as they could take. No armies ever moved faster with more men in history. 
and the war, the Japanese wartime, uh, the wartime cabinet, the minutes of those cabinet meetings for the next five days after this, the number one thing they talk about is that Red Army coming. The Red Army's coming. The Red Army's coming. The Red Army coming. And who would you rather surrender to? The Soviet Union or the United States? Yeah, I wouldn't want to surrender to Stalin. And so, with that, August 14th, the war cabinet said, we got to quit. And August 15th would be VJ Day. Now, it wasn't that simple. And this is one of those things when I talk about, did the atomic bomb cause it? Would Japan have surrendered? We don't know, because it didn't happen. You know, they were out of supplies. They could not find any more, but they might have kept going. Because a bunch of young officers tried to overthrow the government to keep them in the fight. They just assumed the emperor doesn't know about it, we must continue to fight. Now, it failed, but the emperor actually went on radio the first time most Japanese had ever heard his voice and said, we need to surrender. And that pushed the army, finally, to agree to it at noon, August 15th. Now, while this is going on, there's still fireballs. They didn't quit because they dropped the atomic bombs. They're still attacking cities. There's actually a carrier task force off of Japan at the time this is going on, using carrier-based planes to attack Japanese armies. So they kept fighting. They're still sinking ships. They're still fighting in the Philippines, uh, Burma, China, Borneo, besides Manchuria. So the war didn't get put on hold. The last flight of over 250 B 29s on its way to firebomb Japan was right here when they got the word that Japan surrendered and turned around. And they just about didn't get it, they would have bombed an hour after the war. This right. So don't forget that. And so after the war ended, there's going to be a lot, in fact, that right away, justifying dropping the atomic bomb. And a lot of disagreement. Because a lot of American military leaders, in fact, all of the highest ranking officers except for two of the five-star generals or admirals in the United States military said it's not, we don't need to do it. MacArthur didn't want it, General MacArthur didn't want it, Eisenhower didn't want it, um, General Hap Arnold of the Air Force didn't want it, a bunch of them. So this was really controversial. And the plan was, if Japan had not surrendered, the U.S. would attack here, Kyushu, the island, the southernmost island. And if that didn't force them, and then in 46, they would attack near Japan. Hmm? Or Tokyo, I meant to say. They would attack Tokyo. That was the plan. And the casualties would have been appallingly high, especially for civilians. The Army figured at least 100,000. At least. But Truman almost immediately started saying, not 100,000, but started saying how many American casualties would happen. Actually, went from 250,000 to, by the end of the 1940s, he's saying, under. There would have been a million casualties. That's what my history teacher told us when I was in high school. If it would have invaded Japan, it would have been a million casualties. No, nobody thought that. So don't forget that. We have these different people trying to justify why they did it. Doesn't mean they're lying. It doesn't mean. That um, or that they're lying. I mean, it's, or they're telling the truth. I mean, <laughs> they're the lying or they're lying. What it means is they're biased. So if you happen to read documents about this, I'm just throwing things off. Right? You know what I mean? Right? So Japan surrendered. September, they would do a formal surrender on the USS Missouri. And the USS Missouri was a battleship. It is still around. Anybody know where it's at? Hmm? The Arizona, which was sunk at Pearl Harbor, there's the Arizona Memorial for the, the thousand sailors who died. The ship's still leaking oil from 1941. The Missouri now is anchored as another memorial about 250 yards away. I find that really interesting. You have Arizona, and right there is Missouri. If you get a chance, there are a few battleships around as memorials. Go on. They're really cool. They let you fire the guns. I won't let you on my mouth. Okay, so 
with that, the war ended. In Japan, there would be, oh, almost forgot. What became of the emperor? Let him keep him. Still he was still emperor. So we wouldn't accept that condition or even talk about it in the summer. But after it, we let him keep the emperor. And he died in the 80s. I want to say 88 or 86. Emperor Hirohito died. And there's still an emperor. And so they kept the emperor. Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur, who, uh, General MacArthur would be essentially the, <laughs> he'd be like a new emperor in Japan. Would he be the military governor of the U.S. occupation for the next six years? And the U.S. occupied Japan. And Japan was defeated and accepted it relatively well, partially because MacArthur, despite all his problems, did a pretty good job. And what kind of government did they help set Japan set up? It was based on their own government. Yeah, it's a constitutional monarchy with a parliament. Every time the United States after World War II helps, would help a country or dictate to a country what kind of government, it would not be a government like the United States. They would do a parliament. There's a lot of problems with the U.S. government. A lot of flaws, a lot of things don't work. And having a set election really does cause a problem, having set terms. Parliament, you can just call an election, and in some ways it is just a more efficient system. And you should probably know what I'm talking about because there are already people running for president right now. The election is a long ways away. And already start talking about front runners when we have a long ways to go. And they're going to spend, geez, over a billion dollars each in this election. Whoever the nominates. We just announced our candidacy on Saturday or Sunday. Hillary Clinton. And she is the, and to give you an idea how things are, still over a year and a half away, almost two years away from the primaries. And she is now, I mean, she's already called up the, the uh, prohibitive favor to win. And it's still, uh, yeah, almost two years away. And so with that, though, they don't have a permanent long campaign that it's going to be awful. It's going to hurt. So not only that, Germany did not, or Japan, or Russia did not get an occupation zone. They got this island and... A couple of these things, but that's it. They did get some, but that's all. And you can argue this is where we begin the Cold War. Oh shoot, I'm a little late. No, 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 no. Now, this DBQ has eight documents. Eight documents you have to use between six and seven. You can use six or seven if you want to, but you don't have to. You get no extra for using eight. You get maybe a little extra consideration for seven. Because six is fine. And the question is, you have to evaluate a statement. <coughs> yes, please write on this. Underline things. Write anything you want on this. This is all you can write on. Not today. Not today. Not today. Tomorrow you do all that. Oh, we're not doing pranks No, you're just doing, you're going through the documents and writing things out. So I'm giving you like a 10 minute. Sorry, not quite as well. I'll let you stay helping this out to the bell. I don't want that. Yeah, you, and then you turn it in at the class. Oh, and the question is adopt, evaluate the statement. And what you're gonna, what the best way to do is you can agree with it, you can disagree, or the best way, hedge your bets. Talk how you agree and how you disagree, or how you agree. You want parts good, the other parts good, but you disagree. And don't forget, you have to explain what's going on in the war. And that's the three paragraphs. In. What's going on? How it relates to that? They're pretty good documents, right? 